Okay, th thank you, Ian, for, for, for the stuttering introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me for the first time in India. So I, I'm really excited to be in India uh, for the first time in my life. I always wanted to come here. I'm enjoying myself very much. Um, so the title of my talk is Hadnamic Attractors. Um, I think attractors are going to be like just a small part of my talk because what I want to advocate is what are, what, why it's reasonable to, 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 to start thinking about such, such phenomena. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, many of the things that I have to say are reviewed in uh, two articles that I wrote or co-wrote uh, a few years ago. Uh, they also include uh, very pioneering uh, contributions by uh, Paul Cheslin and Larry Yaffe, who were actually the first to, to, to construct uh, the fireball, exploding fireball using, a, using numerical ADS-CFT. Um, and uh, as I'm going to progress uh, throughout the talk, uh, I will finish with uh, some upcoming work uh, done in collaboration with my long-term collaborator, Michal Spajinski, and uh, Rod Jefferson, who's my postdoc, and Victor Svensson, who's my student. So uh, let's start with some introduction and motivation. Um, I want to uh, make like a, one clarifying remark. So uh, what I'm gonna say is, uh, is gonna be truth, but it's gonna be truth in some uh, limited context. And you have to take into account this limiting context. And this, this, this context is that I'll be focusing on, for most of my talk, on conformally invariant theories, for example, n equal to force Frank Mills theory at strong or weak coupling. Um, Without a set of dimensionless scales, so 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 this 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 latter property basically uh, is what one can understand as a strong coupling features. So what I want to confront this with are lectures by Alexey Kurkela, who in a wonderful way introduced a, a weak coupling physics and is going to continue to do this to tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Uh, so very good. So. Um, as Ian said, I've been thinking about like various things that I'm going to talk about uh, for quite some time. Uh, so let me start with something that, that to some extent motivated this whole discussion. Uh, so this is a, this is a plot uh, taken from a paper by Schenke, Jeon, and Gale that uh, appeared in uh, 2010. And it shows a slice through transversal plane in heavy end collisions and depicts energy density as a function of transversal coordinates, right? So, so we had some two, two nuclei that collided. We look at 0.4 femtometers after the collision, and we see energy density as a function of x and y coordinate in the transversal plane. And what we see here is that this energy density has a granular structure. It has, you know, maxima and minima. And um, what's important to, to note is that from... Basically, this moment onwards, uh, these authors, as well as many, many, many other words, w works that mod model heavy end collisions uh, using you know, phenomenological tools, uh, use hydrodynamic description. So from that moment onwards, hydrodynamic description is applicable or is applied to, to model the system. Nevertheless, uh, if you calculate uh, gradients in the system, so if you look how, how much energy density changes, um, as compared to the average energy density, uh, and um, basically measure it in the units of the, what would be the thermal scale, you see that the gradients in the systems are actually huge. So basically, this is a bit of a paradox uh, as compared to the textbook treatment in which hydrodynamics is taken to be a good description of the near equilibrium systems. And here, nevertheless, we successfully, successfully from the point of view of reproducing the spectra of particles, uh, apply it uh, in a situation where, where, where gradients are, are really enormous, when deviations from local thermal equilibriums are really, really enormous. So the question that underlies this whole talk, as well as work by many other people, and also to a large degree the, the work by, by Alexei, uh, is if it, it makes sense, if, if it's reasonable to do so. So, so I want to reintroduce this concept of hydronomization. And what I em emphasize is that in, in a controllable context of um, holography, so of theories with large num gauge theories with large number of microscopic constituents and strong coupling, as well as in later studies in other models, for example, in kinetic theory, uh, what's been demonstrated that viscous hydronomics can work uh, well even when deviations from local equilibrium are large. So I'll, I'll be gradually explaining this, this plot uh, 
in the course of my talk, uh, for the moment, uh, what's important for us is that on the y-axis, what I'm depicting is a, is a measure of an isotropy of a system, of a deviation from equilibrium, which is basically the difference between two pressures that are in the system, normalized with respect to what would be the pressure if the system was locally equilibrated. And on the x-axis, I'm basically uh, giving you a time variable. It's a time variable. It measures time after the collision, say. And uh, there are some sample non-equilibrium states in several models. So one model is n equal to four, four superang mills theory in the holographic regime. So, so this was delivered using numerical relativity techniques. And then there are two kinetic theory calculations. And then on top of this, I uh, superimpose a prediction given by viscous hydrodynamic constitutive relations. And now you might say that from the point of view of this observable, so from the point of view of eventually the, the, the expectation value of the stress sensor, in this setup, the system is well described by viscous hydrodynamics, um, basically over here. So let's forget about the time scale for the moment. But when we go to the y-axis, we see that the system is well described by, by viscous hydrodynamics when the anisotropy in the system is basically 100% of what would be the equilibrium pressure. So actually, what we see is that the hydrodynamics can work, can work very, very well. I mean, you see that the magenta curve remains on top of the, the blue curve from that moment onwards, despite that deviations from equilibrium are very, very significant. And this led to a distinction between, hydrodynamic, between the applicability of hydrodynamics, so, so this newly coined word hydrodynamization, and thermalization, understood as local thermalization, because as you see, local thermalization is going to occur when all the pressures are going to be equal. So when this A is zero, and actually that's going to occur somewhere there. And if you look at the ratio of timescales between the timescales of applicability of hydrodynamics to timescales of um, isotropization, you're going to get basically an order of magnitude difference. So indeed, like applicability of hydrodynamics, from, from, from achieving local thermal equilibrium. So this talk is supposed to be about hydrodynamic attractors. And since they're going to appear later in the talk, I just don't want to leave you with a taste of what, what these hydrodynamic attractors are. Um, so if you stare at this plot, what you see is that at some point, these curves merge, or approximately merge. So in a sense, there is some notion of universality in the dynamics of the system that, at least from some moment onwards, various non-equilibrium states, maybe actually even in various uh, theories, various microscopic theories, follow some universal uh, trajectory, follow in some parameterization some universal uh, feature. And this universal feature uh, was dubbed by uh, myself and Michał Spaniński in 2015, an attractor. So, Towards the end of the talk, I hope that uh, you're going to have like a better understanding of, of what was really meant by this. But for the moment, this is just a teaser and an appetizer. So I told you about you know, applicability of or modeling hydrodynamic, mod modeling hydrodynamic evolution in heavy ion collisions under extreme conditions. Then I told you about the phenomenon of hydrodynamization. Uh, but I haven't told you really what I mean by relativistic hydrodynamics. I mean, it's not really entirely the case because Alexei told you uh, some bits uh, earlier. But in order to uh, somehow introduce the notion how shocking hydrodynamization uh, was, let me state the textbook definition of hydrodynamics uh, that maybe aside from the set of words effective field theory can find uh, in London on Lipschitz, which is that hydrodynamics is an effective field theory of the slow evolution of conserved currents in collective media close to equilibrium. So I put here two question marks, and these question marks are basically the question marks that hydrodynamization uh, makes us put into this definition. So what I want to do in this talk is to try to think uh, more carefully what it takes to talk about hydrodynamics and how to think about it more uh, systematic ways. But for the moment, let me complete the textbook definition. So when we talk about effective field theory, we have to specify um, what are the degrees of freedom in this theory. And in relativistic dynamics, the degrees of freedom are always going to be local energy density, or equivalently local temperature, uh, and local flow velocity. And if we have more conserved charges, then we have to add them to our description. But this is going to be the set that's going to be with me for the purposes of this talk. And then equations of motion are going to be conservation equations of the, of the stress tensor, 
where the stress sensor is expanded in gradients. So what I mean by gradient expansion is that this test stress sensor is going to be written in terms of some constitutive relations. And what I want to emphasize is that this is like a very non-trivial thing to do, because in general, uh, say, a traceless in conformal field theory uh, stress sensor is going to have, in 3 plus 1 dimension, nine independent components. There's going to be only, in 3 plus 1 dimensions, four conservation equations, which means that there's, for these nine components, there are going to be four relations. So somehow five components are, at this level, undetermined, right? So as a result, if we write a stress sensor in terms of four functions, that means that, um, in some sense, uh, we restrict our attention not to you know, the full microscopic theory, but only to some subset of whatever microscopic theory predicts, right? This is the sense in which high dynamics is an effective field theory. So, so equations of motion are conservation of the stress sensor ex expanded in derivatives. So the, the leading term is this perfect fluid stress sensor. So it's called perfect fluid because there is no entropy production. That is, there exists like an exactly conserved current that we interpret as an entropy current. Um, and indeed, like if you look at this stress sensor, uh, you, you immediately see that this stress sensor, when, stress sensor, when you diagonalize, diagonalize it, has a form epsilon p p p. So it has a form locally of an equilibrium uh, matter. And then on top of this, we add corrections. These corrections carry derivatives of velocity and temperature. There's like a more uh, complicated story underlying it. And to first ordering derivatives in general, we would write uh, two terms. One is called the shear viscous, is a, is a shear viscous term. The other one is called the bulk viscous term. So one basically talks about the transversal um, uh, transport of momentum. The other one uh, tells us how the system responds to an expansion. Uh, and the coefficients in front of these tensorial structures having to do with derivatives of velocity and maybe temperature are scalar quantities. They depend only on energy density, or equivalently pressure, and they're called transport coefficients. So for example, the coefficient over here is called shear viscosity, and uh, the natural thing to do would be to normalize it with respect to the entropy density, and I think uh, Johanna mentioned this in, in, in her talk. And in particular, it was this term that was crucial for, for this high dynamic curve uh, on this plot. So that was the only contribution that we included uh, on, on, on that plot. And we neglected all sorts of other terms that can, can... In particular, there was a good reason to neglect this term, because this term is zero for conformal field theories, because uh, it has a non-trivial trace, and conformal field theories, uh, the, the stress tensor has to be traceless. So, so, so this term never contributes there, and the bulk viscosity is zero. Um, just to close the discussion here, uh, whatever comes on top of the perfect fluid stress sensor, I'm going to be denoting by a collective name, pi mu nu. And there's there's going to be a reason for it. I want to think at some point, start thinking at some point about this pi mu nu as an additional degree, as an additional set of degrees of freedom on top of the velocity and energy density. So, um, in some sense, uh, it's always good to have some goal. So, uh, one way to, to phrase a goal is to say, Something will be a success if. So this talk will be a success if like, there's going to be at least two take-home messages for you. So one take-home message is going to be that you understand better uh, why this plot was made and what it really uh, symbols, what was the underlying logic behind this plot, and what are the implications of this plot. And the second reason um, that is equally interesting and perhaps uh, equally important is to get a better idea about recent developments in the course of the past uh, five, six, seven years about what hides here. So as I said, this is the derivative expansion for the energy momentum tensor, and we truncated it at the first order. But of course, you can keep going and add terms with two derivatives, and I think such terms appeared already in Alexis' talk. Uh, you can add terms, third order in derivatives, and so on and so forth, right? So the question is, what are really these terms, and what's the role played by them, and how to think about these terms uh, in the context of applicability of hydrodynamics. So this is a good place so, uh, to pause and ask for questions. Yes. Near plot of this attractor. Yeah. Uh, so the shear viscosity was staying in constant, right? As a, not as a function of temperature. Very good. So shear viscosity itself is a function of temperature. It scales like t to the t cubed. But when you normalize it to entropy density, it's a constant number. For holographic theories, it's 1 over 4 pi. Uh, 
which was the reason why over here I divided by, by, by 4 pi. That's correct. But in general, if you break uh, conformal symmetry, not in holography, but in, in more general setting, it's going to be some function of, of, say, the temperature versus the, the conformal symmetry breaking term. In holography. Oh, sorry, in conformal filter, yes, 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 yes. But what I'm saying is like if you break, uh, then in holography for non conformal filters is constant, but uh, in, in other settings, you don't expect that it's constant. Yes, there's one more question. Um, I think that this is it's, it's a bit too early to to answer this question because this is a research program that only started, and I I'm aware of at least one work that claims the existence of attractors also when the conformal symmetry is broken. However, a comprehensive picture is still not there, both for attractors and also in particular for attractors without uh, conformal symmetry. Is that playing? Yeah. I can't hear you. Please wait for the microphone. Uh, what were the initial conditions here? The, there is an anisotropy homogeneous in space. Okay, very good. So let me let me talk about it a bit more uh, when I get to the to, to, to the details. What's behind this plot? Um, okay, yeah, but 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 I, I will try to remember about this question. Okay, so 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 let's move on. So 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 let me. Let, let me present like uh, something that I believe is like an overarching scheme for all these developments, which is the story of high dynamic and transient modes. So, so luckily, uh, to some extent, they were presented by, by, by Alexei in, in his first lecture. Uh, I want to take like slightly different angle at this, at this issue using a much simpler model. So, so one, one naive impression that you might get uh, from this whole discussion is, you know, like you take, um, you know, this constitutive relation, you truncate it maybe at first order in derivatives, you derive equations of motion that have to do with conservation of the stress sensor, right? And you're going to get like four equations and then you're just going to put them on a computer and try to solve them. Um, as nice as it sounds, actually, it turns out that it's not possible. And it's not possible because these equations of motion are not hyperbolic and they do not have a well-posed initial value problem. And you can actually see it yourself. If you start solving these equations, you're going to see that there's going to be some exponentially growing contributions. And these exponentially growing contributions are going to basically hit you in the face and destabilize the whole simulation. So as beautiful as it sounds, this expression actually um, is not very useful as it is. So you have to do something, something different. And this goes under the name of theories of viscous high dynamics. So what I, what I want to emphasize is that these problems are not there if no derivative correction, corrections are present. So if you just talk about the perfect fluid high dynamics, then there is a way of putting this on a computer. You might have to regulate it somehow if there's a cascade, turbulent cascade in the UV. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, this is, a, this is a set of equations that you can try to solve, and I think you can, you can succeed in it. Once you have these dissipative terms, uh, it's not possible. And this is an important problem to address because we know from the point of view of phenology of heavy and collisions that eta over s is a very important quantity there because it, it allow, allowed us to distinguish between the, say, strongly coupled phase and the weakly coupled phase, right, in, in theoretical calculations. So, so we want to include dissipation, and this dissipation is going to be a microscopic window on what's happening in, in coagulant plasma. So, so what's the idea? So the, the idea is, is actually very brilliant, and it, go, it dates back to, to 60s and, and 70s, uh, and works by, 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 by these people. And the idea is, is not to include directly the dissipative corrections to the stress tensor, so the ones that are going to introduce entropy production uh, in most cases, but actually to say that our stress tensor is, you know, perfect fluid part plus, you know, some new part that we're going to call the dissipative part. And I'm going to denote it by pi mu nu. So pi mu nu is just going to be a 4 by 4 matrix, 4 by 4 tensor. And now we're going to claim that, this pi mu, that there are two equations of motion that are, two set of equations of motion that are obeyed. One set of equations of motion is conservation of the stress tensor with this pi mu nu inserted. Right, and that's necessary because we want our stress sensor to approximate the stress sensor of microscopic theory, which we know is conserved. Right? We want to have a conservation of momentum and energy in our system. But that's not enough 
because now, actually, we have uh, nine degrees of freedom, right? We have as many degrees of freedom as, as we have like, for the most general energy momentum tensor. So this pi mu nu has to obey some sort of equations of motion. And probably at this level, there are many possibilities, right? You can, you can, you can feel that there are many possibilities. But the brilliant idea by, by these people is to write a phenological uh, PDE, set of PDEs, uh, that ensure that as time progresses, uh, your pi mu nu, so this new degree of freedom, is going to decay uh, to what we want. That is like to the high dynamic constitutive relation truncated, say, at the first order in derivative. So how to do this? Well, pi mu nu differs from, from this guy uh, by this amount. So, so, so this is basically taking the difference between the two terms. And what we want to ensure is that this difference of two terms is going to decay uh, exponentially with time over some time scale that we call the relaxation time. So this relaxation time over here is just some judicial auxiliary time scale that might have to do with microscopic dynamics, if you wish, that guarantees that, over, that after a while, the, the stress tensor, whatever we start with, is going to obey high dynamic constitutive relations, right? So in a sense, you already get the feeling that actually, on top of this truncated gradient expansion, you add stuff, you add degrees of freedom. And, and in this sense, this theories of viscous high dynamics are very interesting objects on their own to study. So now when you expand this equation, you're going to get, obviously, four terms. There are four terms in this equation. And it turns out that this set of equations is also ill-posed, in a sense that it's not hyperbolic. But then if you neglect one of these terms, this term, then you get a well-posed initial value problem and actually, you don't really get rid of this property that you recover the viscous hydrodynamic uh, tail. So, so this, this set of three terms is roughly speaking what Miller, Israel, and Stewart um, had in mind uh, when it comes to you know, a relativistic causal viscous uh, hydrodynamics. So it turns out that um, what you can do is you can try to solve these equations uh, in derivative expansion. So you see, like there is a derivative in sigma because, like, that's like the the the, the, the shear viscous term having like one derivative of velocity, and on the right hand side there is also a derivative of pi mu nu. So if you want to solve it in derivative expansion, you neglect this term, and then the answer is pi mu nu equals minus eta sigma mu nu, and this is precisely the answer in viscous hydrodynamics uh, located at first order in derivative expansion. And then if you go to second order you have to include the effect of this term, right? And you generate some terms with two derivatives. And now, in holography, um, people calculated you know, such second-order gradient contribution to the stress tensor, and it turns out that they were not able to consistently match to this theory. And in fact, it turned out that, that this theory was not really the having all possible terms. And you have to supplement it with some number of terms, like these terms that I depicted here. And only if you do this, and you solve uh, this equation of motion for ingredient expansion to get high dynamic constitutive relations, then you recover the prediction, say, of, of holography that is a microscopic prediction, right? And this theory that I wrote here is uh, from the initials of, of people that I'm going to be calling BRSSS, or BRS3 for short. And this theory, uh, to a large extent, has been the working horse of whatever were the developments in hydrodynamic simulations of, of uh, heavy end collisions at, at RIG and uh, LHC. Okay, um, so the punchline from the previous slide is that hydrodynamics on its, hydrodynamic gradient expansion on its own doesn't really make sense from the point of view of you know, solving equations of motion. And you have to somehow uh, introduce additional degrees of freedom uh, in order to, to, to make sense of it mathematically. And uh, since you introduce additional degrees of freedom, you can ask yourself how these additional degrees of freedom manifest themselves at the level of linear response theory, right? So as Alexei uh, said, and also Johanna discussed it earlier, I believe, uh, you perturb your system in a thermal state, uh, you linearize in perturbation, and you try to see what's going to be the response of the system for a perturbation. And since you do everything at the linearist level, natural to work in momentum space, right? So in this way, you derive the retarded uh, Green's function, and you look at the singularities of this retarded Green's function in, um, for a fixed value of momentum, 
uh, in complex omega plane, right? These singularities are guaranteed to lie for sensible systems to lie in the lower half plane. And then get to the question what they are, what they really are. And it turns out that if you play this game for, for this BRS3 theory, then uh, and you look at a particular channel, so that's that's called like the, the, the sound channel, then uh, the singularities are gonna obey the, the cubic equation. So there's gonna be three of them. And uh, for a fixed value of k, the they're gonna be just single poles, right? Obviously, because this means that there are just three of them. And there's going to be two poles with a property that as momentum gets smaller and smaller, these poles uh, go arbitrarily close to the origin, which means that their decay rate gets arbitrarily small. And then there's going to be a single pole that lies on the imaginary axis, which is going to decay over a time scale set by this relaxation time, set by this additional uh, time scale that we introduced to our system. However, in conformal field theories, of course, relaxation time has to be inversely proportional to, to temperature, right? So, so this guy basically decays over time scale set by the set by the temperature. So we have so 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 the, the take home message from the slide is that in this Miller Israel Sierra theory, we have um, two kinds of degrees of freedom. We have high dynamic degrees of freedom that are long left. And we also have non-high dynamic degree of freedom that is short-lived, that decays after a time scale set by the, by the temperature. And at some point, we're, we, we should be able to neglect it and be left just with the hydro, right? So, so now let me move on to, to, to other microscope. Oh, so, so, so one thing that I want to emphasize is that from this perspective, uh, you might think about this BRS3 theory actually as an independent model of quark gluon plasma, as, as, as stupid as, as it sounds, in a sense that it's a theory that you know, holds initial value problem, it has high dynamic tail, and it also has stuff that is not captured by high dynamics. So from the point of view of understanding applicability of high dynamics to heavy ion collisions, actually it's not such a crazy idea to start our studies with BRS3 theory. Historically, it's not really what happened, but actually uh, this is really the simplest setup in which all the or most of the features that are seen say in holography are, are there, yet uh, even an undergrad student to, to, to recover. Instead, we just you know, tackle like the, a much harder problem and, and then go, went back to the, to the easy one uh, after we were quite advanced in, in, in much harder problems and just got confused. Yes? Sorry? Yeah, so, 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 so since I'm in India, I, I think I should say uh, at least two things. So one thing is that uh, Shiraz Minwala and collaborators uh, constructed a gradient, gradient expanded stress tensor um, in holography up to second order at the same time this paper was published. Uh, and basically this, this, this match with, with holography was only possible after, 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 after their work because they, they basically had like most of the terms, or I think all the terms that, that are depicted here. And secondly, um, Logan Iagam, who's, who's now based uh, here, was also pursuing um, you know, related studies in the context of gradient expansions, but now phrasing the language of you know, effective field theory uh, in the springer keldish uh, formulation, right? So like, there's certainly like a very strong patriotic Indian component in the studies of relativistic dynamics in the, in the past uh, 15 years or, or so. Just one comment in this uh, context that what Shiraz and uh, company did was a bit more than this BRSS paper in the sense that they could uh, study some transport coefficients which you can only see if you do nonlinear. Uh, you won't see at the level of the quasi normal mode or linearized hydrodynamics itself. So they even computed yeah, I'm recorded, that. so I don't want to put value to, 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 to any work. I, I think both works were very important and actually both works were quite distinct in a sense that they had distinct goals. So, so I think it's very nice that uh, you know, people start thinking about similar things independently and actually derive something that is self-consistent, right? That both approaches were consistent with each other. Okay. Um, so, so, so now holography, I mean, we, we already spent like the, the past uh, five minutes of our talking about uh, holography in some sense. Um, you, can, you can play similar game in ADS-CFT, so you can Derive. It's it's a much harder calculation actually. I'm mean, like uh, objectively nowadays, like it, it's considered an easy calculation. But when it was done, it was like much harder to what I was presenting about BRS3. Um, you can consider perturbations of you know ADS5 uh, Schwarzschild black hole. Um, you know uh, divide these uh, perturbations into different channels. And over here, I'm just showing the results for the for the sound channel. 
The structure that you see is uh, kind of similar. I mean, this is the structure that I think Johanna was, was alluding to in, in her lectures. There is like a, this, this, call, this picture is called like a Christmas tree picture by, by, by Andrei Starinas and, and his collaborators. So what you see here is a, is a set of, of modes. So there's going to be transient modes. So these are the transient modes that are depicted here for, again, three value of momenta. And they move on the, on the complex plane. For example, at the lowest momentum, it lies here. And then as the momentum is increased, like it, it gets shifted. Um, similarly for this one, for this one, for that one. And what you see from, from this picture, basically, is that uh, all these guys are uh, exponentially decaying in time over a time scale set by the temperature, actually over even a faster time scale because there's like a factor of 10 here. So, so, so these guys are going to be very fast gone from the description of your system. And then there's, this, there's, a, high dynamic, there's a high dynamic mode that uh, is depicted here that starts you know, very close to the, to, the, to the origin and then moves as momentum is increased. And this hydraulic mode comes into pairs, like symmetrically with respect to the, to the imaginary axis. And as momentum is decreased, these pairs like move uh, both uh, horizontally and vertically. And uh, this motion corresponds to hydraulic uh, dispersion relation for, for frequency. So as Alexi was saying, this, this dispersion relation starts as omega equals speed of sound plus minus speed of sound times k. And there are higher order corrections. These higher corrections partly are responsible for, for dissipation, right? Yes. So the que I can repeat the question. The question was like, in what sense there is a separation in this picture? Uh, so you see that at low momenta, I mean, unless you, so, so I, I, I somehow, the, 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 this, this, this blue does correspond to momentum 10, 10 times t, so it's like a very large momentum. So at least for low momenta, uh, momenta of the lower than, than t or, or of the order of t, uh, these guys are going to be much faster decaying than hydrodynamic sound waves. So in this sense, like if you wait for time of the order of, 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 of temperature, uh, they're going to be exponentially suppressed, so effectively uh, gone from the dynamics of your system. So this is precisely this is the precise sense in which I said these words. Okay. Very good. So, so, so this theory, this BRS3 theory, um, had this feature that this new degree of freedom uh, that we add to the stress tensor constitutive relations to replace the hydrodynamic gradient expansion decays exponentially to um, to 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 hydrodynamic to, to viscous hydrodynamic constitutive relations. However, uh, in holography, you see that. These transient, these transient degrees of freedom, uh, they have both real and imaginary part in their frequencies. So they are both exponentially decaying, and at the same time, they're oscillating. So one question that you can ask is, can you mimic this at the level of this theories of hydronomics? So the idea now is to write effective of motion, uh, not caring about deriving this equation microscopically, but just having an equation of motion that captures two features. One feature is to be able to reproduce hydrodynamic uh, constitutive relations up to first order. So basically to be able to capture the shear viscosity term, because this is like the important term that we have to have there. And on the, on the other hand, also capture this, this, this exponential decay with oscillation of whatever is not really hydrodynamics, right? So we have like these two features in the same package. And it turns out that uh, it's actually uh, in objective terms, easy to do this, uh, because what you have to write is that your pi mu nu, so this additional degree of freedom, obeys not really like an um, overdumped equation, like a pure decay equation of motion, but actually uh, it obeys the equation of motion, roughly speaking, of damped harmonic oscillator. And uh, this is basically the equation of motion that you write. And now, it turns out that uh, when you linearize uh, this equation of motion in the sound channel, you get like the fourth order um, equation for singularity. So the singularities are going to be still single poles. Uh, this, there, there's going to be four, four of them, and they come again in pairs, right? One pair is going to be the hydrodynamic sound wave, and the other pair is going to be basically what we included as this oscillating and decaying uh, uh, freedom. Shania? So the thing that you have written that has at most only one complex or two pair of complex poles, uh, 
but we know that the Christmas tree has infinite number of them. So in a way, this uh, whatever you write, it there'll be always some time scale beyond which it cannot uh, address this. Uh, uh, it, it will fail. Like it's only an effective description up to some time scale, which is much be a little bit beyond the hydrodynamic time scales, maybe, but it still cannot be a complete uh, thing because it simply doesn't has all the poles that we get from uh, from gravity. You're, you're correct that 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 this equation does not have a built-in feature of of higher modes. Um, initially, we thought that it's not going to be an issue to include higher order high, higher higher modes. However, it turns out that that this equation is very subtle. And it's subtle in a sense that it's not apparent. Uh, but if you look at this, if you look at this uh, equation of motion, if you look at this equation for singularities, right? It's a quartic equation. And what you want to ensure is that all these all these uh, singularities lie in the lower half plane. And it's not apparent uh, that this equation is going to possess such a feature. And it turns out that there is like a very delicate balance between having all singularities lying in the lower half plane and having no superluminal propagation. And it's actually very hard to infer this uh, already for the second order theory. So if you want to write a theory containing um, higher derivative terms, so for example, a quartic theory would correspond to including also the effect of the second quasi neural mode, it turns, out, it turns out that it's gonna be even more subtle to ensure that this theory is both stable and causal. So as a result, this is like uh, somehow uh, a proof of principle that something can be done. However, uh, bearing these difficulties, we never try to you know, extend it beyond this limiting case. Having said this, it turns out that from theoretical purposes, this is actually quite interesting to analyze, and it taught us something about the Hadman gradient expansion. Yeah. So, so, so one thing that one thing that I want to emphasize that's going to be maybe important later. So, so one thing is, is that obviously we tested using holography. In a sense, we saw that actually this theory does a better job in reproducing the features of time evolution of the stress tensor by including this lowest quasi neural mode, right? That, that's good. And, and one important thing that, that might not be super apparent is that when you, when you have such equations of motion, in order to solve them, because you have second derivatives, you not only need to specify uh, this, this pi mu nu field, but also you have to specify the derivative of pi mu nu field on a time slice. So what I want to say is that if you want to have a theory that somehow generalizes this BRS3 approach and captures some, some features of the underlying dynamics in a more accurate way, then this comes at the price that you need to be able to specify uh, you know, uh, the initial conditions for this theory in an accurate way. And this requires you know, some control over what happens before the transition to the new high dynamic phase. Yeah. So, so as I said, like uh, what I told you so far was about mole, modes in linear response theory in the setting of theories of high dynamics and holography. So it turns out that in all these all these studies, uh, modes were just single poles. There are two kinds of single poles. There are single poles that have the property that as momentum is taken to zero, they were approaching the origin uh, arbitrarily close, and as a result, like they were long lived and slowly evolving. So, so they were corresponding to excitations that are going to survive for arbitrarily long, as long as we make momentum small enough. And there were like fast evolving excitations that were exponentially decaying over time scale in this context set by the temperature. And these were like transient quasi normal modes. Uh, in kinetic theory, the structure of this transient sector is, is, is different, and uh, I think you're going to hear about it from, from Alexi tomorrow or the day after tomorrow at latest. Um, okay. So, so yes, yeah, so, so, so let, me, let me now switch gears and try to make closer towards understanding of the plot I started with, right? So uh, this plot was, um, was derived for a very particular kind of a dynam dynamics that is called the boost invariant flow. I'm not really sure if this appeared earlier in lectures uh, today. This is basically a model of heavy ion collisions, which um, we basically think about colliding um, two sheets of matter that have in infinite extent in the transversal plane. So we're not going to have, say, elliptic flow or anything like this. The transversal dynamics is in, in the case I'm going to consider completely trivial. The only thing that this system is going to have is a longi longitudinal dynamics. So, so there's going to be like, you know, some collision process and there's going to be some associated expansion and, and so on and so forth along the longitudinal axis. 
And now, if we have dynamics that involves only longitudinal uh, expansion, then we know that the dynamics are going to depend on the time after the collision and on the position on the longitudinal on the con con collisional axis. And uh, as a result, um, we know that whatever we're going to do, we're going to be searching for functions of two variables. And searching for functions of two variables is actually quite hard because that requires maybe solving PDEs and things like this. And the question is, can one make uh, life easier? And here comes actually a physically motivated assumption by Bjorkin, um, who said that let's introduce some notion of rotational invariance, but in uh, space and time variables, right? And if we have like a rotational invariance on a, on a plane, say, that means that things are going to not depend on an angle, they're going to just depend on the radius, right? So an analog of a radius for you know, Lorentzian real-time dynamics is going to be a proper time. And then the analog of an angle is going to be a rapidity. So over here, I'm, I'm showing for you the x naught, so time axis and longitudinal axis. And it turns out that we're going to be considering dynamics that do not depend on x0 and x1 independently, but only depends on these variables through this boost invariant combination. Right? And as a result, our dynamics is going to depend only on one variable in field theory. So in holography, it's going to, be, it's going to require solving equations of motion for two variables and so on and so forth. Right? And it has like a very bearing consequences on what we are able to do with, with, with these studies and where we are able to go. So... So in this proper time, rapidity coordinates, uh, the most general uh, conserved stress tensor can be written in terms of one function of, uh, of proper time, uh, which is the energy density. So the energy density is, is sitting here. There's going to be longitudinal pressure, and there's going to be transversal pressure that is equal in two directions, because we have, uh, in the transversal plane, nothing really interesting is happening. And um, what we expect, of course, is that in our systems, interactions are strong enough that even if around tau equals zero, so close to the light cone, we start with some far from equilibrium state, as time is going to progress, so over here I, I showed for you like the one constant tau slice, at some late enough constant tau slice, the system is going to be at first hydrodynamized and then locally, locally equilibrated, right? So like these, these are going to be kind of dynamics that I'm going to be interested in. Now, what I want to have is I want to, I mean, still, I want to simplify uh, my life uh, quite a bit. So I want to parameterize this stress tensor in, in some way that's going to be insightful, right? So if we stir the stress tensor, we see that it has uh, three different components and is actually already given in a diagonal form for free. So we don't have to do anything to diagonalize it. It's already diagonal. And now... When I talked about local equilibration, what I meant is that if you take some stress sensor and diagonalize it, you're going to have four independent eigenvalues, right? One is going to correspond to a time-like eigenvector, most likely, and the two remaining ones are going to correspond to space-like eigenvectors. And these ones corresponding to space-like eigenvectors, I'm going to call pressures. So over here, we see immediately longitudinal pressure and transversal pressure. So if if a condition for us for equilibration is that the pressures are equal, then what we need to do is we need to take a difference between, say, transversal pressure and longitudinal pressure. And now it's still a dimensionful quantity. So in order to talk about something nice, physically nice and dimensionless, maybe we want to normalize it with respect to what would be the pressure in equilibrium. And you know that in conformal field theory, the pressure in equilibrium is going to be epsilon over 3. Okay, very good. So, so as I said um, at the beginning of my talk, whatever I have to say uh, is valid for conformal uh, field theories. So as long as you don't include any additional charges and so on and so forth, I feel like this is, roughly speaking, everything that, 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 that you, should, you should be considering. Oh, yeah, okay. Sorry. What, what I have to say is that assumption of boost invariance has nothing to do with what's happening in the transversal plane. So when I talk about the boost invariant flow, I mean, I have in mind that I'm going to just consider the most trivial situation in the transversal plane. But of course, you can consider uh, even like a full elliptic flow in the transversal plane. And indeed, like uh, many of the works in heavy ion collision community study the phenological heavy ion collisions using boost invariant assumption in the longitudinal direction and, you know, having the full dynamics in the transversal plane. <laughs> 
So you can do this, but it's it's still more complicated, and I just want to sim focus on the simplest case uh, possible. Okay, um, yeah. So 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 the, the in an interesting observable that actually allowed us to to do uh, quite a bit of things that we thought are not really possible uh, is to take a difference between transversal pressure and longitudinal pressure and normalize it to what would be the pressure in equilibrium, which is epsilon three. So this is a nice quantity because when it's zero or close to zero, we, uh, we know that um, from the point of view of this observable, we are um, in effectively local thermal equilibrium. Um, and if we can, if this function of time, we can match with the hydrodynamic gradient expansion tracked at some order, then we can say that we hydrodynamized, right? So, so, so in this sense, it's a nice quantity to consider. And now it turns out that uh, for, there is also like a time variable. So like this is this proper time. Proper time is again a dimensionful quantity, right? So maybe you want to introduce something that is nice and dimensionless. And since we are in conformal field theory, we don't have really an, any external scale. So it seems that like a very natural quantity to consider is going to be a local temperature. So I define a local temperature as a temperature of uh, a medium in global thermal equilibrium having the same energy density. So when I say effective temperature, I do not really imply any sort of thermalization. It's just like some sort of like effective dimensionful scale that uh, might be responsible for dissipation. And we'll see that is going to be responsible for dissipation. Now, the beauty of this uh, whole construction is that the great hydrodynamic gradient expansion for, for this flow is going to be just like a Taylor expansion in 1 over W. And since it's just like a Taylor expansion in 1 over W, that allows us to probe the structure of the gradient expansion at large number of derivatives, because that's going to be terms like 1 over W to 100, 1 over W to 200, and so on and so forth. So basically, that's, that's kind of the idea uh, why I needed to introduce all this, all this structure. OK. Um, so, so we have this BRS3 theory that consists of conservation equation for the stress sensor and effective first order equation of motion for this additional degree of freedom pi minu, or set of degrees of freedom pi minu. And now in this boost invariant setup, uh, the conservation equation of the stress sensor corresponds only to one equation, and this is the equation for the derivative of this W variable with respect to time, and it's basically what defines for us A. And then we have like the second equation that was like this additional equation of motion that we introduced in order to get the, the nice features that we wanted, and it turns out that this equation of motion is actually very non-trivial when you stare at it, but it's nothing else than the first order ODE for A. So actually, from the practical perspective, this is clearly a boring equation. It's a boring equation because it's always the same. It doesn't really depend on the model. It's going to be the same for holography. It's going to be the same for this BRS3. It's going to be the same for this uh, other theory that I introduced. It's always there. So this, is the, th this equation is something that is theory dependent, and it has like this interesting content. In particular, as I said, since the gradient expansion corresponds to um, an expansion in, in 1 over W, and maybe I should uh, write it on a on a blackboard to put everybody on, a, on, the, on the same footing, it turns out that, that the gradient of, of velocity in the boost invariant setup is proportional to, to 1 over tau. And um, it might not be really uh, super apparent, but what you have to bear in mind is that these tau and y var variables are curvilinear. And when you have a derivative of velocity, you mean a really covariant derivative. So there's going to be a Christopher symbol. And this Christ Christopher symbol is precisely this 1 over tau. And so, so this is the gradient of velocity. However, what you are supposed to measure this gradient of velocity with is uh, 1 over the temperature. So you have to multiply it by 1 over the temperature. And then this guy is nothing else than 1 over w. So this is the reason why the gradient expansion in, in this setup is an expansion in this 1 over w variable. So, so basically, what one can do is one can take this equation of motion and solve it uh, formally in a 1 over w expansion. So, you know, you just plug in ANSATS and you let your uh, mat Mathematica code to solve for the recursion relations. Um, and after a few seconds, you generate this plot. So this plot corresponds to um, hydrodynamic gradient expansion tri truncated at 100 derivatives. And actually, it's very easy to generate hundreds or maybe even thousands of these terms. 
But the the interesting, the key feature of 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 the study is that if you take a ratio of the two subsequent terms, so if you take a term a n, a n plus one, so a term with n plus one derivatives, and you normalize this contribution with respect to the term with a n with, with n derivatives, so a term a n, then it turns out that this ratio, as a function of number of derivatives, starts exhibiting linear growth. And when you see such a when you see such a such a plot that it means really that individual contributions, individual terms, uh, so these terms, from some moment in derivative onwards, start exhibiting the factorial growth. So basically, this, this, this means that dynamic gradient expansion in this theory is actually a divergent series, in a sense that uh, it's a series that has a zero radius of convergence, that whose, whose formal sum, understood naively, does not really exist. So in a sense, from this perspective, uh, in, this, in this setup, it doesn't really make sense to talk about you know, hydronomics to all orders. Because even if we were able to write such a series, uh, without like, uh, being very careful about how we're going to resum it, this expression does not, make, does not make any sense. And to, to anticipate a bit, this is basically the story of attractors to provide some sort of an alternative uh, definition of what hydronomics can really be to all orders, and then try to see how to back up this statement with, you know, a resummation of, of that sort of an expression. Okay, any questions about this? Before? Yes. Oh, that's correct. So, so, so this sort of, so, so I would say that this other expansion corresponds to uh, at least superficially, uh, in in this uh, in, in this in in this expression, to correspond to whatever sits here that does not have a form one over w. And there's going to be such terms actually, as I'm going to show in the next transparency. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Okay. Uh, so let's let's move on. Um, yeah. So. Um, so yeah, so we, so we have a dynamic gradient expansion that is a divergent series. And as a divergent series, it does not really make sense uh, without a resummation. Um, on the other hand, one thing that I want to stress is that if you look at the series, this series does not have any free parameter. So if you look at each term, these are some numerical values. I mean, you know, numbers like including maybe factors of pi and so on and so forth, right? So as a result, like at least term by term, there is no freedom of initial conditions uh, in this series encoded. So, so there is some sort of a contradiction, uh, or maybe actually it's, it's, uh, these are two observations that point in, in, in the same direction. So, so one, one thing is that there is no information about the initial conditions encoded in individual terms in this series, and at the same time, this series does not make really sense about resumation. And it turns out that uh, this is a very beautiful manifestation of a phenomenon of resurgence, in which, as I will be discussing now, uh, ambiguities in resummation correspond partly to providing information about uh, initial conditions. So that the same, the same term that's going to correspond to an ambiguity in the resummation is going to, at the same time, be relevant for information about initial conditions that, we're, that, that we have to specify in order to solve this first-order ODE as an initial value problem. So, so coming back to, 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 to your question, um, when you linearize your um, equations of motion, so when you linearize this, exp this, this expression around this formal solution, um, you're going to get some you know, linear differential equation. And as a linear differential equation, the amplitude can be taken to be an the amplitude of a solution can be taken to be whatever, right? Because it doesn't really enter the, the, the equation of motion. So the result is going to be one parameter family of solutions. And the beautiful thing is that one parameter family of solution is going to exponentially suppress in W. So there's going to be, there, there is like this expansion in one over W that corresponds to high dynamics expanded to all orders. And on top of this, there come terms that are exponentially suppressed in W, together with like a further, you know, one over W expansion, further derivative expansion, and uh, also like a, a term like this. 
And, and these guys are nothing else than you know, this, this non-dynamic degree of freedom, this transient mode in this BRS3 theory. But now this transient mode is considered not really as an uh, expansion on top of global thermal equilibrium, but it's considered as a small perturbation on top of something that evolves according to hydrodynamics. So that's why it, the, the frequency gets a bit changed. Uh, we get this pre-exponential factor, and we also get like an infinite grade function, right? So, so I, I, I'm pretty sure many of you uh, know very well uh, the story of divergent series. And uh, as I said, uh, divergent series on their own do not really make sense to all orders. You have to resum them. And a standard trick to, to, to deal with uh, divergent series is to use the Borel transformation techniques and inverse Borel transform uh, techniques. So the, the idea is that um, we're gonna, we, have a, we have a series in which individual terms behave like n factorial. So uh, the term 1 over w to the n behaves effectively like, one over, like, like n factorial. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the transform in which each term in the series we're going to divide by the corresponding n factorial. So this is going to render a series that has a zero radius of convergence to a series that has a finite radius of convergence. So this series has a finite radius of convergence. And now, um, of course, you don't really have the series to all orders. Uh, so you have to deal somehow with analytically continuing this series to some larger region of complex plane. And uh, I mean, one trick that you can do, and actually this is a trick that works very well, is to consider a, pa a pad approximation. So imagine that this series you know not to all orders, but only to terms uh, 1 over w to 200. Then you can represent this, 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 this Borel transform as a ratio of two polynomials, each of the order of 100, such that in total there are like 200 independent numbers in this ratio. And then knowing this series, you can reconstruct these numbers. And now this you take as an approximate analytic continuation of the Borel transform series on some region of complex plane. So now that we have uh, analytic continuation, uh, what I have to say is that there is actually a, an inverse transformation that you can do in order to invert this Borel transform. And this is an integral transform. It's, it, it, it's an integral connecting zero with infinity with uh, you know, some exponent. And what we, the argument is this, is this Borel transform. And now this expression uh, clearly is going to have singularities on the complex plane, right? Because it's a ratio of two polynomials, right? So, so when, the, when the polynomial at the bottom has zeros that are not really zeros of the polynomial at the top, then we have a, we have a single pole. Um, if we have like a collection of single poles that as a function of the truncation, so for example, if we increase here the number of terms from 100, 100 to 200, 200, and we're going to see that these poles get denser and denser, then we know that these, pole, actually, these poles represent nothing else than the branch cut, right? So over here, it turns out that if you look at the structure of singularities of this expression, what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, branch cuts lying on top of each other that start precisely at the point which is the frequency of the lowest non dynamic degree of freedom in the system. So what I'm trying to say is that when you're going to be trying to resum this expression, uh, depending on what contour in complex plane you take, you're going to get a contribution that effectively behaves as if you're adding or subtracting some contribution from, from non hydrodynamic sector. So, so clearly the resummation is ambiguous. But the good news is that the solution is also ambiguous, right? Because we have to specify initial condition. Because this, 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 whatever, whatever, whatever way we represent the, the solution to the equation of motion for A of W, it, it's, it has to solve a first order of the E. So it has to include one parameter as, an, as a freedom of choosing initial conditions. So the idea is that actually the only thing that is well-defined is an expression that is called a trans-series, that is an expansion that has double sum. One sum is over all derivatives, but the other sum is over, you know, we have like this exponential term. So we add this term as like one contribution to trans-series. It's going to come with derivatives on its own. Then because the equation is nonlinear, we're going to have also like a square of this expression, cube of this expression, and so on and so forth. So in this case, we have like a double sum. And, and it turns out that each 
this exponent is going to come with integer powers or non-negative integer powers, and each each such a power is going to come with uh, you know a gradient expansion on its own. Each of these gradient expansions is going to be divergent. However, it turns out that the whole sum, this whole expression, is going to be well defined up to one real number, and this one real number is going to be what captures information about the initial conditions. So it's some sort of like a miracle that, that goes under the name of resurgence that the, the divergent, ex, the divergent ex, expansion doesn't really make sense on its own. However, if we you know, add on top of this all these exponentially suppressed terms that are there in the system, then this whole sum uh, makes sense and it's mathematically well-defined and captures the information about you know, all the initial conditions that, that we have in our system. But to, to put it in other words, actually, to put it in other perspective, it turns out that by studying the, the, the dynamic gradient expansion alone, we can learn something about whatever lies on top of hydronomics. So it's very similar to quantum mechanics in which by studying in interacting quantum mechanical systems perturbative expansion at large orders, uh, we learn about non-perturbative effects such as instantons or renormal ones. So, so, so this is a very similar phenomenon. So, so one, one important thing here is that the, the non hydrodynamic sector had only like one exponentially decaying mode. The equation was nonlinear. So what we have is like we have like a singularity corresponding to the, to the non hydrodynamic mode that starts at some value on the major exit and goes all the way to infinity. Then there's going to be like a two, two times value the, the, the position of this branch point because uh, that comes from quadratic corrections, right? Cubic correction is going to have three times and so on and so forth, right? But this, this was like purely decaying. Now, if we have a theory that have an oscillating uh, transient mode, then we expect that uh, this mode is going to not lie on the, in, as seen in the Borel transform, it's not going to lie on the real axis, it's going to actually lie off real axis in complex plane, right? Symmetrically with respect to the real axis. And this is the, indeed the structure that we see. And we also see its integer multiples. So it's like a second order uh, equation of motion in this language of A of W. There are two real integration constants, and there's like a two-parameter trans series. So like it's like it's 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 a bit more complicated object to to consider that was done actually by uh, Spanisky and Aniceto in 2015. And now we can move to holography, right? So so you might say, okay, I mean these are very simple models. Um, how about like the real gauge theory? Uh, so here is the result. So 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 this result actually uh, the first paper predates like these developments about BRSS. And the, however, BRSS was really essential in order to understand uh, basically this plot better. So in 2013, we consider hydrodynamic gradient expansion for n equal to four strand meals in this boost invariant setup, truncated at 240 derivatives uh, of velocity. Later, uh, other authors generalized it to 380 terms, and uh, there was an interesting recent development that focused on the, on the transient part of this expression. What you see here, the, the long story short, is that you see the lowest non-hydronomic quasineural mode, you see the second lowest non-hydronomic quasineural mode, the tier is nonlinear, so you seem to see traces of the, you know, twice the lowest uh, hydronomic mode, and so on and so forth, right? So what I'm trying to say is that also in this uh, much more complicated case, the structure is clear and the same, that is, you construct hydronomic gradient expansion at large orders, and you see there are traces of non-hydronomic sector, and then the structure of transseries and resurgence guarantees that the solution is well-defined um, and unique up to the choice of whatever integration constant you have to pick to, to, to define it. One subtle thing that actually touches upon Giuseppe's question is that in this case, when we talk about holography, there's going to be infinitely many quasinal modes. So actually, there are infinitely many integration constants. And actually, um, you can see it in holographic formulation in the statement that when you solve for holographic equations of motion, these are equations of motion for metric, right? So this is like effective description of the stress sensor and dual field theory. On a constant time slice uh, in the boost environment flow, you have to specify uh, some metric components as a function of the radial coordinate. And this functional freedom um, is somehow mapped by the holographic equations of motion into the freedom of choosing, uh, you know, these coefficients over here. Um, and whatever whatever non-equilibrium state was, were considered in the context of holography that I was showing before, you know, like there are some, you know, smooth functions defined between the boundary and maybe putative horizon 
and depending on maybe like where these functions have like the biggest the biggest non-trivial support, then like the features of thermalizations were or high dynamizations were a bit different. Yep. Yes. How many uh, of these quasi-normal mode poles one has been able to recover from this resummation of hydrodynamics? Um, so it's somehow an exercise in like being very effective in resummation. So so I would say that. Uh, this plot was made with the original data, and what you can recover from it is like the the two lowest uh, the two lowest quasi normal modes. Um, unfortunately, I'm not really sure uh, if this gets better in this in this in this recent work. So 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 so, so I don't know. Maybe maybe three, maybe maybe, maybe a bit more. But this, what, what I'm trying to emphasize is that. We know how to compute quasi normal modes, right? So, so it's not that like you know this is a tool for any prediction. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that actually, it's it just it's supposed to put us in a mood to start thinking in a correct way about applicability of hydrodynamics and what is captured by hydrodynamics and what is not captured by hydrodynamics. The predictive power of 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 this plot is actually limited because we know how to obtain these frequencies, these complex frequencies, uh, using much more efficient methods. OK, so, so, so to summarize uh, that part of the talk and to move uh, basically to, to attractors, um, um, the statement that I want to make is that in this setup, uh, and also actually in a setup in which uh, one talks not really about like one-dimensional expansion in um, in Bjork and flow, but also in a setup in which one talks about one-dimensional expansion in cosmology, uh, hydrodynamic gradient expansion diverges. I put a star here because there was a recent paper in April by um, by uh, Pavel Koftun and uh, collaborators uh, in which it turned out that uh, hydrodynamic gradient expansion at the level of hydrodynamic dispersion relations has a finite radius of convergence, and I'm going to comment on this uh, at the end. And uh, however, the way I want to view this divergence of hydrodynamic gradient expansion is, is as, a, as a sort of an important ingredient in this phenomenon of hydrodynamization. And I'm saying this uh, because when we talk about divergence series, we don't really have this natural notion of the radius of convergence for which this series should be applied or maybe outside not applied, right? The series has a zero radius of convergence. So that means that applicability of the series truncated in some order is not really uh, controlled by what comes on top of the terms that we truncated within the series, but actually what are the series that are what, what are the terms that are not included in the series whatsoever? So these are these exponentially suppressed terms. So basically, roughly speaking, the statement is that as soon as these exponentially suppressed terms are going to be irrelevant, then hydrodynamic gradient expansion truncated at low orders uh, is going to be applicable. What's not clear from this reasoning and uh, for, for what you really need to have numerical studies is if you have to truncate this uh, series at the first order, second order, or third order, right? Like that, that actually might depend on a theory and actually it might also depend on, on, on initial conditions to some extent. Yeah, so, so let me not, not go into details here. Let me, let me just stress the, the, the analogy with, with, with quantum mechanics. So um, in quantum mechanics, uh, we have like a per Actually, sorry, I, I, cut, I, I cut like an important part of this table. In quantum mechanics, we have a perturbative series in the coupling constant. And in the language of this non-equilibrium physics that I described, we have a gradient expansion in this one over W variable, right? And then in quantum mechanics, we have uh, non-perturbative effects such as instantons. And roughly speaking, in analogy with our problem, this corresponds to this transient exponentially suppressed uh, phenomenon. So, so basically, this is this is nothing else than than basically Feynman's statement that uh, you know similar equations have uh, similar properties, right? I mean, like we have divergent series describing uh, non-equilibrium physics, we have a divergent series des describing uh, quantum field theory, and uh, there's some mathematical analogy uh, underlying it. So, so let me before attractors appear in their full uh, glory, let me let me discuss uh, one more thing. Uh, to which I have like a very special emotional attachment because it it took us like about two years to to crack to crack it in in all details. It's uh, largely based uh, on on a work written to, together with Alexi. Um, it's not really an old work because uh, the V2 appeared in uh, 2018, and a work with my PhD student Victor Hansen. So um, 
as, as Alexi is going to describe in RTE kinetic theory, if you look at the retarded two-point function at non-zero momentum, uh, there's going to be single poles that correspond to hydrodynamic degrees of freedom, but there's going to be also like a non-hydrodynamic sector, but this non-hydrodynamic sector is not really like a single pole or, or some number of single poles. It's actually a branch cut. So, so, so this was a structure that was uncovered by, by Poro Machke in a very nice paper in 2015. And later, um, what we decided to do with, with Alex and collaborators um, is to try to look at the hydrodynamic gradient expansion in this kinetic theory, in this relaxation time approximation in kinetic theory at large orders, right? So, so this goes a bit in this direction of like a predictive power of gradient expansion in large orders. And um, if you're powerful enough, you're going to generate such a plot. And this plot is very interesting because it has some misleading features. So there's like a, there's some branch cut or maybe a stack of branch cuts along the real axis. And this would presumably correspond, I mean, naively speaking, to something that is exponentially decaying, purely decaying. But there are also like these, these sorry, there are also these arcs. And these arcs, naively speaking, you would, corresp would correspond to something that is exponentially decaying and oscillating. And uh, when we saw these arcs, we got like quite excited about them. But we really couldn't really we, we couldn't really make much sense out of them in the sense that in the first version of this paper we we didn't really have a prediction what they correspond to. However, after looking at this problem for about two years, um, we resolved it, and it turned out that these arcs are like a pure pure uh, humbug. And what I mean by this is that um, equation of motion itself uh, in this case is very very complicated. And it has a very rich analytic structure in the complexified time variable. And this phenomenon of derivative expansion doesn't really care if we talk about time being real or you know, uh, complex. However, for physical applications, you're just interested in whatever happens along the real axis, basically speaking, right? So as a result, like all, all these features over here have to do with time complexification, so something that you're never supposed to do when you consider initial value problem. And the only thing that is physical uh, is the stuff that lies on the real axis. And the stuff that lies on the real axis is a series of infinitely many independent modes that are exponentially suppressed with the same uh, decay constant. However, they differ when it comes to the parallel suppression and subsequent features. So it's a very, as I said, I have a very emotional attachment to this study because it took so long. However, it was like very rewarding uh, because to a large degree we, we really understood what's going on and, 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 and we, we really understood why the original picture uh, was misleading. And this is also the reason why I'm a bit skeptical about like trying to make predictions from, 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 from such figures. Okay, so, so, so it's, a, it's a good uh, time to take like a minute or two of break and answer some questions if there are any because we're moving to the last part uh, of my presentation. Thank, thank you for this question. Um, so um, let me go back to the original work. So this is the work in 2013. And um, when we uh, wrote it up with Romal Dianig and Przemek Vitaszczak, um, we noticed the following things. So, so, so this is the picture of the borel plane, right? And we're still supposed to do a borel uh, resummation, right? So when we do a borel resummation, say that we, we can integrate, we have to integrate from zero to infinity. So this is zero, right? We have to connect it with infinity. So there's like there's gonna be a, there's gonna be integration contour that goes like this, and there's gonna be an equivalent contour that goes like this, and there's gonna be many other inequivalent contours. However, the you know the the difference between the result of this contour and that contour is always discrete. It's just like a contribution from, from this singularity. And it was very confusing because on the other hand, we knew that when we excite holographic system, you know, we should have like a continue, continuous freedom in picking whatever are non-equilibrium contributions, right? There is no reason these contributions have to come in multiples of pi or like e to the i pi or whatever, right? So, so so back then, like we couldn't really resolve it, but only if in the study of simpler model of this BRSP model, we understood that the, there's like this underlying structure of trans series, 
And uh, the freedom of, roughly speaking, I, I'm not sure this is like mathematically fully correct. Roughly speaking, the freedom of picking initial conditions is going to sit um, um, also where there's a freedom in resummation. So, so what I'm saying is that the freedom of taking a cut, taking a, uh, a contour for borrow summation along the real axis or going off real axis uh, is going to come with some discrete choice. And discrete choice is going to be compensated by some, some constant, some number. And this number is going to have basically uh, two parts. One part is going to be a part that's going to be adjustable to what contour you picked. And the other part that's going to be typically real uh, is going to be where the information about initial conditions uh, are sitting. It's a bit more complicated story because, as you see here, uh, there are more ambiguities uh, in resumming the series. But as I told you, like these ambiguities uh, are unphysical, so they never really come with a freedom of specifying, you know, a real number to them because the the, the physical initial conditions um, never care about them. There's one more question, yes, please. So, so this is a very good question. Um, I think formally, formally, I would say that, uh, as I said earlier, that one expansion is going to roughly speaking correspond to this one over w expansion, and the other expansion is going to correspond to you know adding basically higher powers of pi mu nu, and these higher powers of pi mu nu are going to be uh, coming with you know like this, this transient, this transient phenomena. Uh, when one does such expansions, like typically, one does not really you know, truncate it and leave it like this. One wants to somehow close the system of equations and use it as some sort of an effective description, right? And what, I, what I'm trying to, to say is that when you close the system, then you introduce additional degrees of freedom. And at the same time, you make the gradient expansion, even if you truncated the low order initially, uh, diverge. So, um, I mean, in order to explain it, let me go back to this... Uh, Sorry, let me go back to this miller isler sewer theory, right? So over here, like you write such an equation, right? This expansion, you might say, is to the second order in the expansion in pi mu nu, right? Because you have like a quadratic term in pi mu nu. Um, and uh, maybe to second, accurate to second order in derivatives. However, despite the fact that uh, you are just uh, matching it to the second order in derivatives of velocity and, and temperature, if you now try to treat this equation uh, on its own uh, without really alluding to where it came from, just like as a closed uh, set of equations, then you're going to actually generate like an infinite gradient expansion for pi mu nu, and you're going to generate infinite number of powers of, of this non-high dynamic uh, excitation. So somehow it has both expansion, the Knudsen and, and Reynold expansion to all orders. However, like this, these two expansions are not going to have much to do with the microscopic description you originated from. They're going to be basically an artifact of truncation. Okay, so attractors. Um, so, so the idea of attractors uh, is very simple. So since um, a dynamic gradient expansion is, is actually uh, not well defined to all orders, in the sense that it's like a divergent series in these setups, um, maybe there's like a way, better way of thinking about high dynamics. And uh, I must say that um, the statement that there might be a better way of thinking about high dynamics uh, dates back to a pioneering work by Ed uh, Shuryak and Michael Lublinski that appeared around uh, 2007. Um, and uh, this idea resurfaced um, in the context of the work uh, I wrote in 2015 with Michał Spalinski. And then um, Paul Romachka, a bit later, two years later, um, found um, some new instances of attractors that actually triggered uh, a lot of interest in, 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 in this phenomenon and maybe actually brought me here to India. Uh, and eventually, uh, also, it revived my interest in this. So, so this is roughly speaking what I want to cover. Um, so let, let's forget for the moment about the gradient expansion. Um, let's look at our favorite theory, BRS3 theory. <laughs> 
So this is the theory that is described by the first order um, differential equation. And we know that one thing that we can do is we can expand this first order differential equation to 1 over w. On the other hand, we know that this is going to generate for us like this divergent series, right? So maybe we're, we don't want to do this. Instead, let's, let's just um, solve this equation of motion for our various initial conditions. So various initial conditions means that we pick some value of w, for example, close to, to w equals 0. And on this value, on, on this, on this, for this constant value of w, we initialize, uh, we initialize uh, different uh, values of a, right? So these are, these are different non-equilibrium states. And we let them evolve. So as we know, in this setup, there is like an exponentially decaying mode. So we expect that these solutions are going to be exponentially decaying. So indeed, like we see that these different blue curves like are exponentially decaying. And from some moment onwards, they merge to a single. And the single curve is something that we call an attractor. And this curve, you don't really have, at, at the level of this picture, you don't really have to define in terms of a gradient expansion, right? You just see it visually, right? And now we can ask a question, and, and this question, actually, I must say, I, I don't know what the, what the, what the ultimate answer is. Uh, this question is, is this curve really objectively defined? In a sense, uh, does this curve make sense all the way from w equal infinity to w close to zero, or maybe w equals zero? However, what we realize is we can do the following thing. We can take this. You know, we can take this equation of motion and instead of, you know, expanding in the gradients the regular way, which is like this 1 over W expansion, we can do something that in cosmology goes under the name of slow roll approximation. And actually, Michal Spainski earlier uh, worked quite a bit on, on cosmology. Uh, so the slow roll approximation uh, means that we're just going to neglect the derivative term and we're going to solve whatever is left in the equation. So when you neglect the derivative term, you're just going to solve for, 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 for this part of the equation equal to zero. And it turns out that this is this red curve. And this red curve, you know, very nicely extend all the way to the vicinity of w equals zero. So what we, what we named the attractor was this red curve that starts somewhere here and goes all the way to w equal to infinity. And uh, it should be obvious that this curve from a you know, certain value of w onwards is well approximated by truncated gradient expansion, but in principle, in this setup, might make sense for all values of w, regardless of invoking the, the derivative expansion. Yes? Uh, that's correct. Sorry? Very, very good. So, 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 so that's a very good remark. So this is a quadratic equation, as you pointed out. So there are two solutions. So you're asking, what's the second solution? It, it turns, the other solution is a repul repulsor. So it's a solution from which, as time progresses forwards, like uh, the, 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 the solution of your equation is obviously want to run away. So it's like some sort of like an unstable, unstable fixed point that uh, is not really displayed here. But it is there in the equation. And its late time behavior it does not correspond to high dynamics, and its late time behavior uh, is basically uh, governed by you know like the like these very precise combinations that sit in the equation. You might say that you know in this setup also like these very precise combinations that define the attractor are you know come from you know like the way this BRS3 theory is 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 set up. However, the next transparency uh, should convince you that these attractors actually might be a much more general story and much more interesting than, than, than this. So, so moving on, um, one obvious question that you can have is uh, how this attractor looks like uh, in this language of, the, of this trans series, right? So this double expansion in uh, the gradient expansion and these transients and powers of transients. Um, so, well, I mean, like... Uh, we had results, uh, so, so basically what we can do is we can just try to resum this series order by order in, in transients. So we truncate it to terms quadratic in, in this exponentially suppressed uh, mode, and uh, including terms, I think, of the order of like uh, one or two hundred of derivatives of velocity. And there is like this, there is this term here that, uh, whose real part corresponds to the freedom of picking the initial condition. And 
when you construct this attractor using the using the slow roll approximation, um, you can try to fit the real part here, and the real part is 0.875. So this raises a question: um, Is there anything fundamental about it? And uh, at this level, I don't know. I mean, like it's it's something that 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 I find interesting, but I simply don't know. So you might, I mean. The way I present it, you might say, okay, I'm like, it might be some, you know, accident. It, it might not be that interesting after all. You know, like, this is like one set of equations. Why, why would I care? And now comes um, uh, Paul Romatka uh, with his paper in 2017. So two years later, precisely two years later, uh, I uh, basically copied uh, an original plot in Paul. So a notation is a bit different. Basically on this axis, it's still this double. On the y-axis, it's not really A, it's some, um, you know, uh, a minus something, and a, and a prefactor. However, using a very similar philosophy, uh, that is the slow roll approximation, uh, Paul was able to find something that uh, he called attractors also in the case of the RTA kinetic theory and uh, also in the case of holography. And for comparison, he also provided this BRS, he also reproduced the BRS3 results that uh, came from, from our work. So this is what I presented on the previous transparency, this is, this is the new stuff that, that, that Paul contributed. And the central idea for this paper was that you have to somehow, in this parameterization, you have to find a solution of your microscopic equations of motion that is as flat as possible. And with this logic that is basically the slow roll approximation, um, these are these curves. One thing that I want to emphasize that might not be super apparent is that the you know, RTA kinetic theory and holography are theories that are not really naturally written in terms of the stress tensor. These are theories that use some other auxiliary variables, in this case, the distribution function, one particle distribution function uh, for RTA kinetic theory and for holography higher dimensional metric. So actually, the phase space in these theories is infinitely dimensional in a sense that in order to solve initial value problem in this theories, I not only have to specify A at a given value of W, I also have to specify A prime, A double prime, A triple prime, and uh, so add to the number of derivatives. So what I'm trying to say is that um, in this sense, like this understanding of attractors might, might not be fully satisfactory because it's not really an understanding, uh, like the full face, face, face space picture is like just the understanding at the level of a slice through face space. That only in the case of BRS3 was really appropriate because the full face space is just like what's depicted here. Okay. Um, one, one thing that you see here immediately is that these attractors are still done in the Boosenbrand flow in which we just replace the microscopic theory by something else. Um, and uh, in, to, to a large degree, like uh, these attractors were generated by, by saying, okay, we have to introduce this nice combination A, and we have to, we, we're going to use like this combination of proper times times the effective temperature, and then we're going to be staring at, you know, the slow roll approximation, and then we're going to maybe be able to cook on something or not. So this is roughly speaking the, the logic in many of, of um, very interesting. However, uh, Many of these de developments are really limited to one-dimensional uh, examples or, or examples with, which have some underlying symmetry that, that, that make our life easier. So in a sense, um, while this is a programming development, one might want to have uh, some notion of an attractor that uh, might not be really this curve, but it shares some degree of universality in a sense that it might be easy to generalize to m much more complicated examples. So. Um, so this brings us again uh, to, to BRS3 theory, uh, over and over again. Uh, so let's consider BRS3 theory. I don't want to use like this W and A variables. Uh, we want to use something that uh, is going to exist in, in, in other flows and also in other theories. So in BRS3 theory, one may think about the phase space as being specified you know, on a constant time slice. We have to specify the three components of velocity, energy density, and some number of components of pi mu nu, right? Like all the independent components of pi mu nu. So this is our phase space. In the case of the boost invariant flow, the velocity is fixed by the symmetry. Um, uh, energy density, uh, well, I, I, I prefer to use temperature. And this pi mu nu actually reduces, roughly speaking, to the derivative of temperature. So at a given value of proper time, the phase space is basically a plane of t and t prime. So if you want to solve equations of motion, we have to specify you know, initial conditions 
in a plane of t and t prime at some value of tau, and then just let our equations uh, go forward in time. So imagine that we pick some square you know, in phase space. So like this is some bounded region. It doesn't have to be a square. It has to be a bounded region um, in which you know, we specify some set of initial conditions. And then we just let them evolve. And what you observe, actually, that um, is, is quite interesting is that there is some notion of attractiveness uh, in this setup. Uh, in a sense that as time progresses, the, the initial conditions or the, 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 the portion of phase space that is relevant for description of what, was, what were our initial conditions shrinks and effectively loses dimensionality. So our proposal is to introduce a notion of an attractor, uh, maybe a new attractor, or maybe something that actually is related to the old attractors, that's not clear, this is uh, research, that has to do not with you know, like a very specific parameterization of solutions, but actually has to do with you know, defining uh, phase space variables for your microscopic theories, and trying in this phase space analyze uh, from a given set of initial conditions how this set loses dimensionality as time progresses and eventually becomes described by hydrodynamics. So over here, this, this line, roughly speaking, corresponds to a hydrodynamic description. And it's actually easy to understand because um, uh, many of you know that uh, at asymptotically late times, the, the temperature in Björken flow is going to behave like some integration constant, tau to 1 over tau to 1 third. And as a result, you can see that there's going to be some, roughly speaking, linear dependence on t and uh, t prime for a fixed value of tau. And this is, roughly speaking, what you, what you start seeing here. Yeah? So the proposal, and we'll see where it gets, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, is that uh, a natural way to think about attractors is to think not about the, you know, like this A and W, but actually to think about losing dimensionality in the phase space description. It's going to be a description of attractors that is very much based on a set of initial conditions. So for different set of initial conditions, there's going to be different attractors. The thing in common is going to be losing dimensionality in phase space. OK, so, so I end stood up. So let me provide the, the executive summary. Um, because the hydrodynamic expansion in this interesting example that has to do with the with heavy end collisions um, is a divergent series. It means that the applicability of hydrodynamic description is not really limited by you know how these different terms in series are with respect to each other, because we know that the, at some point they start behave factorially. But actually, what comes on top of this, and this basically is the underlying theoretical development that that leads to hydrodynamization. So. So in particular, if you look at the blue curve here, you see the result, like sample initial condition for n equal to 4 supernatural meals. The, the, the magenta curve is the hydrodynamic green expansion truncated at the first order. And you see that the two curves merge after a transient oscillation. So this transient oscillation is the lowest lying hydrodynamic, uh, non-hydrodynamic degree of freedom. After it decays, as well as like you know, all higher ones, then hydrodynamic green expansion becomes applicable, and maybe you reach an attractor. And, um, as a result, and I think like this is probably the most important outcome of, of this development, is that applying hydrodynamic description to heavy end collisions under extreme conditions, and remember that the name of the program we're participating in has like a QCD under extreme conditions, uh, is not a priori crazy. It doesn't really imply that, you know, for QCD we should do this. However, what we know is that there are theoretical circumstances in which similar uh, in, in, in related setups, uh, this, this happens and, and is a reasonable thing to do. And hydrodynamic attractors, so actually the, the, topic, the, the official topic of this talk is, is, is some attempt to, 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 to quantify uh, universality in behavior uh, after you know, all these transient excitations are gone. So in order not to uh, make organizers angry, let me just display some open problems that I think are interesting and, and maybe the audience uh, wants to learn more about it, so I'm happy to, to describe them. Thank you very much.